excited about these two tools. How's that? Is that better? I think it was just a setting. <laughs> okay, this should be better. Yep, all right, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, all right, let me <laughs> start again. Um, welcome to week five, lecture two, authentication, authorization. So Auth and Auth is our fun little title this week. Um, I'm very quiet. How's that? Is that better? It's pretty, should be pretty good. All right, let me see. I didn't change anything here. What's going on? Ooh, so quiet. How's, oh, is that too loud now? How's that? That should be good. How's this? Hello, hello. Give it a few seconds to propagate, right? Take three. <laughs> We're good to go now. Can't really make it much louder. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's start from the top again. Welcome to week five, lecture two. Um, we've got three awesome topics today, authentication, authorization, and persistence. Um, and you'll also be happy to note that this is the final lecture between, before, um, the midterm break. So we all have a chance next week to catch up on what we're behind on, um, and to, um, maybe go over certain content, um, that you need to go over again. So, all right, let's get straight into it. Um, okay, I gotta switch here. Now this is probably gonna stuff up. Give me a second. Alrighty. Okay, so, auth and auth. What are we talking about here? And why is it called the same thing twice? <laughs> um, let's take a step back. So in Comp1531, the major project that you're working on, we're building a system. You're building the back end to a web system. Um, and one of the things when we're designing systems is that they need to be secure. So you can't have um, registered users access other users data. You can't have non-registered users access particular user data unless that data happens to be public. Um, so basically we have these systems that should be storing um, data and making that data accessible only to specific users. And so if we're doing that, then we need a way to let a user prove or um, provide evidence that they are who they say they are, that they have access to that specific data. And once um, we can prove the identity of someone, um, then we can say, okay, here's the data that you have access to. But just because user one has access to user one messages, for example, user one should not be accessing user two's messages. So we need a further layer um, on top of this. Um, and, and that's the authorization aspect. So we need a way to know who is allowed to access what and should someone be able to access our system at all. When we're dealing with auth authentication and authorization, um, there is a set of best practices developed over time in the community um, with well-researched, um, theoretically backed and secure approaches that we can build upon and use to authenticate and authorize users in our system. So this is why typically with these sort of authentication and authorization patterns, um, you're not going to really go off and figure out your own way of doing it. The best thing to do is use what's tried and true and that we know, um, we know that it works and, it, and that it's secure. So authentication. Authentication is the idea that we can identify um, a valid user. So prove the identity that you are who you say you are. Authorization is then saying, well, now that I know that you, your name is Jake or that you're Os Oscar or anything like that, um, what are you allowed to access within my system? Um, and these are really, really important concepts. Um, when you do it right, no one should think about these concepts. When you get it wrong, um, it's really, really bad. 
Um, you're at risk of breaches. You're at risk of lawsuits. Um, you can lose sensitive user information. Um, and you can be liable, in fact, um, for user, potentially sensitive user data. So how, how important is this? If you scan this QR code right now or you go to this URL, you can put in your email address that you commonly use to sign up for things and have a look at how many um, websites you've signed up with that have leaked your personal information in data breaches. You can do this right now um, in the lecture. Scan the QR code, you go to this website, it's a secure website, you can trust this. Um, they just take publicly um, accessible data breaches and let you know that if you're part of any breaches. And most likely, unless you're really diligent about changing your email for every single account, you're going to be part of a breach. Um, there's nothing you can do about it. You've signed up for a website, they've been breached. And some of those websites um, will in fact have breached your password. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and it'll be kind of crazy how, um, how big companies have actually lost um, users' passwords. Here's just a couple of them. In 2013, Adobe suffered a very large breach um, that contained very weakly hashed passwords that were easily converted to plain text. We're going to be talking about hashing in this lecture. Um, so the Adobe breach leaked 153 million user accounts. Um, Evite is another popular website um, that stored 101 million passwords in plain text. Every single one of them breached. Now, if a user's email and password was breached in the Evite uh, leak or the Adobe leak or any other leak, um, and you've reused, the user reuses that username and password on another site, they're completely breached on all these other sites as well. So these are really big companies storing passwords in plain text. And we're going to talk about how that's such an awful idea um, and what we can do to, to work around it. And this is all falling into the concept of authentication. So if you've gone through and you've looked at have I been owned and you're part of a breach, now might be a good time um, to change some of your username and passwords um, across your internet presence. Um, so... If a user registers on a site like Adobe, like Evite, or some website that you'll, build, you'll be building one day, um, they provide you a username and password, typically, and the website stores that username and password in the database. When they log in, we compare the username and the password to the ones that we, they provided us the second time, and then we can say, yeah, that works, or that doesn't match. Yes, I'm letting you in, or yes, I'm not letting you in. This would be like the most naive... Um, attempt at building uh, an authentication system. And if you think back to, you know, you might be thinking, well, I know you should never store a plain password. Like, why, why would that? It, I mean, it happened with Evite. 101 million passwords. And I don't think they're a small company. So people do it still. Um, so how does something like this work? Let's actually um, sh show some really naive um, authentication and authorization um, code in, in Flask. So let me just go to my desktop and make sure this all looks good. Something's not right here. Alrighty. You also my hidden little stream panel. Um, give me one sec as well. I just need to, again... Okay, I'm back. Alrighty. Okay, can you guys read this okay? So what I've got here is like, if I was to build this really naive system, um, how would I go about it? So this is a Flask server, just like the Flask servers that you've been using um, in, the, um, in the project and in the, in the lab, labs and stuff. A few of you have asked if the slides are available. I thought they were. Um, do you guys want me to take two minutes to maybe get the PDFs? somewhere or do you want me to power through and do it in the break sorry about that oh I see what's happened okay I see, I see, I see. Oh, 
All right, give me, give me three minutes, everyone. You can enjoy the music while I... Okay, I'm back everyone. Uh, okay, uh, if you get the, if you refresh the GitLab where all the lecture PDFs are, it's in there now, 5.2, and I've sent you a, a direct link to it. So you should just be able to download it. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's just this one that was missing, so. Okay, we're all good to keep going. I'll give you all a second to download it. Oh no, a colleague was in the Adobe. Breach, that's no good. All right, we're good to keep going. Mike's looking good, we're all looking good. Okay, oh, I'm gonna keep going. Um, Alrighty, so we were just talking about how would you implement something like a really basic authentication system in Flask. So here we have a Flask application. All the lecture code for this is available. Um, and what do we have here? So we've got some data store, just like we use in the project. It's just a dictionary. Um, and there's this register route here that I've written. So it's just a route called slash register. Remember, this is just a Flask server. It's a post method endpoint. And when you hit this register, we're expecting in the body of this request, there's a username and password field. So you can imagine when you go to a website to sign up for some app, you put your username and password in, you hit register, and it triggers a post, um, a post request um, off to the server. And it's storing this um, in the dictionary 
uh, called users. So it's just storing the username and password. When you log in, we then loop through all the users in our database, a little data store, and we check is the username and password exactly the same as what they register, what the user registered with. And if it is, let's generate a token. And this generator token is in this case is just returning the username. So the user's token is their username. Let's bring this server up. Um, this is called auth v1. All this code is available again, like always on in the lecture code PDF, uh, GitLab repo. I'm opening it on port 15333 for some reason. I'm also just going to put in debug equals true. Um, so I don't have to bring down the server if I happen to want to change something. Um, alrighty, the server's up. So we can bring up Postman. Oops. Let's zoom it in a little bit. Um, okay, that's not the right server, is it? So I want to hit this port and let's register and I'm going to post a body in the body. It's going to be the username. Oh, it's an object. The username I'm just going to put is Jake and the password I'm going to put is secret secret. Don't share it. All right, I hit send. Oop, it says it's not allowed. That's because it was still set to get. I want to post this, right? Because it's it's uh, register is a post. So I hit send here and we get, okay, this means it was successfully registered. So it came off to the register endpoint. It put the username and password. It took it from the request, put it in this dictionary object in Python. Um, so it's just stored in memory. And then because that worked, we just generated some token, which is just the username. So what that means is now I can, I can log in with a username and password. And if it matches, it will give me back the same token. So to, to test it, let's put it, put the wrong password in. Let's just put no password. So if I log in with no password, I get a 403 forbidden. You don't have permission to access the resource. Um, that's because in the case that uh, the username and password don't exactly match, I'm telling Flask to abort the request with a 403, which is the not uh, authenticated HTTP code. If, however, I put the correct password in, I get, I, get, I get access. My token gets returned, and you can imagine that now you can give the user all the information that you want to um, to access whatever system it is that you're building. So that's a really basic, you know, naive, implementation of authentication um, in a Flask server-esque environment, right? But we, we mentioned with these breaches, um, let me go to Keynote. Um, we mentioned with these breaches that with this approach, let's assume that that username and password gets stored in, in, a, in a database somewhere, that if that database gets breached, my username and password and email, my address maybe, or whatever information is being stored about me is now completely out in the open. And we don't want that to happen. So how can we ensure that someone is who they say they are, they can prove their identity with their username and password, but that they aren't, um, but we don't need to store the password in plain text. That's the problem we're trying to solve. And the way we solve that is with hashing. So what, what is hashing? Pretty simply, we have some data. Okay. Let me just, oops. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. We've got some, we've got a hashing algorithm. So hashing is basically an algorithm. So it's a block of code that takes some input. And in this case, it takes a string. So CS5131 could be the input string. That string is input into a hashing algorithm and out we get what's called a hash. We get a mangled um, string that represents the hash of some input string. And that hash, um, if you look at it, even if a program looks at it, you can't tell um, that it came from CS1531. So it's taking some data and doing a one-way transformation on that data to represent the hash of that value. And 
if you know the key that something was hashed with, um, you can get the original, you can check that um, that one way transformation is correct. And hashes, right, so if you use the same hashing algorithm and the same hashing key on the same input string, you always get the same hash. So it's not like randomly generating a string. Um, it's always a one-way map. How can we prove this? Right now, let's see here. You can all go to this website that I've just typed in the chat, password generator MD5 hash, and put in to the website um, CS1531. Capital C, capital S, you gotta make sure the capitals are the same. And tell it to use MD5 hash. And you should see that it hashes it to the same hash that I'm showing on the screen here. That's because I used the MD5 hashing algorithm to generate this hash. So if you use the same algorithm on the same input string, you will also get this hash. You can go off and, and, and demo this now and let me know if you're getting the same, the same hash back. Yes, no, maybe. Is the website still working? Yeah, same hash. Awesome. So that's pretty cool if you think about it. We have this one-way transformation where we can store, instead of having to store a password, we can store... Um, oh, this slide's alright. Um, we can store the hash instead. And we don't need to worry about contaminating, losing the, 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 the original input string. Now, there's a number of different um, hashing algorithms that exist. Um, I use, in this example, the MD5 hashing algorithms. There's the SHAX algorithm, so SHA-1, SHA-256, um, which are usually designed for verification. Um, and... Basically, without going into to, too much depth into hashing algorithms, um, there are, you know, quicker hashing algorithms that are less secure, and there are more um, compute, computationally intensive hashing algorithms that are a little bit more secure. What, what, what do we mean when we talk about security? Well, basically, a lot of research goes into these hashing algorithms to make sure that if you have two different input strings, um, you don't get the same hash. There will always be clashes with hashing algorithms, but the likelihood is so low that we're not really concerned about it. But really, really naive, poorly implemented hashing algorithms that are really easy to crack um, isn't what we really want to use. So for these authentication systems, we want to make sure we're using um, state-of-the-art hashing algorithms that are quick enough for the purpose. And typically... Um, in um, password authentication systems, a hashing al algorithm called bcrypt is the one that's recommended, but SHA-256 is, is also generally seen as good enough. It's not perfect, but it's probably good enough. Um, and so this basically solves the big problem with our authentication, because now instead of having to store um, the, the user's password in plain text to compare it, I can instead store the hash. And now when the user comes along to log in the second time or the third time, I hash their password again and I compare the hash. And then I never have to store the password. So let's demo that. Um, in, in, again, in Flask, in on the language and the framework that you've been using. So here I've modified the um, authentication a server that we, did, we wrote that I was showing you in, in iteration one. And now we're going to be using um, hashing. So you can see here the magic line because Python, you know, does everything for us. <laughs> um, there's this hash library um, that we can import. And now when we register, whoops, when we register here, I are still exactly the same thing. I append to my user's dictionary um, I append the username, I can store the username, I'm not too concerned about that. But I don't store the plain password. I store, I do this funky line. So what's going on here? 
So I'm saying that in my dictionary, put the key password, yep, all good, and then store, using the Hashlib library, use the SHA-256 hashing algorithm, and hash, whoops, I might have to just zoom out one more time, sorry about that, and hash this, this string, this content. Well, what is this content? It's just the password that we get from the login, from the post request, um, and we have to encode it um, in a specific format before we hash it, just so that we make sure we're consistent. Because sometimes um, strings represent uh, get represented slightly differently on different operating systems and things like that. So you just want to make sure you get it to a consistent format, so you're just encoding it as a hexadecimal, and then hashing it using the SHA-256 algorithm. So we never actually store the plain text password. It never enters our system. Beautiful. So let's bring the server, the old server down and run this. Um, it's running on port 1533. Once again, I'm going to register um, with a post request, username Jake, password secret secret. That should all looks okay. And we get back this token Jake. So it's successfully registered me, but it never stored the password. Now, when I come along and I want to log in, same sort of thing. I present my username and password, but I don't check the password field in the object. I hash that object using the same algorithm in the same format. And I compare the hash, not the actual password because I don't even have the password now. So let's log in. And if that all worked, you should see I get back this token again. And that, that's exactly what we wanted. If I put the wrong password in, even if the password is just one character different, and I try and log in, we get that error again. Because the hashes, even though the, the passwords were slightly different, the hashes would be computed to be wildly different. Um, but even if they were just slightly different, they, they don't, they're not the same anymore. So I know that this wasn't the correct password. So I don't know what the password was, but I know it wasn't the correct one because it hashed to a different um, value. That's really cool. Now, I think what I've written here is this secrets. Yep, the secrets route. So I've got this get route here um, that gets the user's information from the token. So it's like, this is something that you, you need to do, um, that you need to be authenticated to do. And so if I hit secrets, um, and I think... Oh, let's not worry about that. that. We'll look at that in the next iteration. This is all I wanted to show to show in this case. And just to show again that this is working, what I wanted to do, just let me, I'll have to bring this down. Put debug here. When we log in, um, we generate this token here. I just wanted to print um, the password that we had stored. Um, do, 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 and I think we just do this. Oops. All right, that looks good. So I'm just printing out the password of the user. Uh, what is this not like? So we append that there and we just want to print out that the password is, oh, no, 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 uh, it's capital, yep. I want to print from the data store. Um, the data uses password. All right, let's bring the server up. Okay, um, oh, that still doesn't like that. Sequence index is not an int. Uh, this is an array. Oh, that's an array. Oh, that's right. Okay. So I can't just look up. Oh yeah. I can just do get the, get the first string, get the first user. I think that's what I wanted to do. All right. Let's see if that, that might not work. I can't, uh, so let's register. 
Okay, let's... Um, I did this in the... Oh no, that was in the register. There we go. It gets printed out here. The password is this hash. You can't see because my... Well, you can sort of, you can see well enough, but you can see here. So we never stored the user's plain text password. We only stored the hash. Um, all right, awesome. Now, um, Alex has asked, if the hashing method is leaked, does that mean everything is not secure? Um, no, that's the beauty of hashing. So you all have access to the MD5 hashing algorithm. Um, Sorry, sorry, we use SHA-256 here, but you've all got access to it. You can, I'm happy that you know that I used SHA-256 here. Um, I probably do want to hide it. We'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Um, I don't want to advertise it, but sometimes our code is open source. So you can see that we used SHA-256. We all have access to the same, um, to the same hashing libraries and things. So why does that mean that it's secure? Well, because you don't know, it's a one way transformation. So just because you know that string A always results in hash A, you don't know that from hash A, what input A was, unless you can break the hashing algorithm because it's a weak algorithm. But the ones that, we, that you want to use for authentication um, shouldn't, be vulnerable. It takes years, like decades sometimes, to be able to go backwards from the hashing algorithm, from the result to the input. So it's completely fine that people know the hashing algorithm. Um, they're mathematically secure, like Felix has said. Yeah, until quantum computing comes out, then we're, then we're all screwed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the school, the electric, the school of electrical engineering at UNSW, um, they're working on, on quantum computing and if they crack it, yep, we're all stuffed because quantum computing can theoretically crack, um, these deterministic, um, sort of problems very, very quickly. Um, so, all right. So that's authentication. And this is a pretty, we're, we're happy with this model. This is pretty much how authentication works um, in large scale systems, but it doesn't solve the authorization issue. So if everyone has the same level of access, what would stop a regular user from deleting an entire um, channel in your project or getting admin control, right? We need some sort of layered um, authentication system for our applications. And this is authorization. So once a user's pr proved their authentic authenticity, what are they allowed to do? Um, so we need some sort of indication of the user's access level and what all the different access levels are. And we need a particular way to identify a particular user. So, in, you know, the username is an identifier, for example, Jake is, Jake was the user we registered. Jake is able to do certain things. Um, Felix or Alex or um, anyone might not be able to do all of those things, depending on the system that you build. And then we need a way to persist this for a small amount of time. And this is called a session. So we need to make sure that if, if I log in and then I want to do something else, I don't have to log in again. And then I want to do something else. And then I have to log in again. I've got to continually approve who I am. We don't want to do that. And this is how we have a little bit of persistence here um, with, with sessions. So how can we build this? Well, we can use something called authorization tokens. So authorization tokens are a secure way of transmitting authorization data between two services, such as a client and a backend. And the technology... Um, the, or the implementation that we're going to talk about today is something called JWTs or JSON web tokens. Um, and um, they are basically a, 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 an agreed upon format of storing authorization data to provide information for something like a session or access to a particular piece of information. And I've put a lot of time into building these slides. Uh, so I really hope they help really simply break down um, what a JWT is. So a JWT is made up of three components and literally any JWT you see will have a sequence of strings, a characters, a, a period, another sequence, a period, another, another sequence. And I've gone and um, 
color-coded these three segments and we're going to talk about what, what these store and what these represent. So here we have segment one, the header. The header represents um, the type of JWT that this, this is. So it's the signing algorithm used to encode and decode the JWT. This is important. Um, you need to advertise this. So you need to say, hey, if I'm a JWT, here's how you can sort of take me apart and look inside of me. That's stored in the first of the three segments. Then we have the second segment or the payload. This is where you put the information that you want to store. So this could be a username and a role. This could be a username and a, a token or whatever it is that we need to store, um, that we need to transmit, not store. And this is just basically a JSON object that goes in the, in, in the middle. And then finally you have the signature or well, what's the signature? Well, it basically takes um, the content of the header, the content of the payload, so the first two segments, and using a secret key calculates a, a signature that basically represents, hey, this JWT was intact. It was signed the right way and the content um, is the correct content. And basically it's doing another hash to calculate this. So let, let me just go through that sort of one more time. We have a, a, a JWT and we're basically saying what type of JWT we have here. We have some data that we're trying to transmit. And we want to make sure with, with, with this authorization that from server A to server B or from the client to server, um, someone didn't come along and change the role. So on the server, I generate this JWT and I say John Doe is an admin. Is not a, Let's say they're not an admin. So I say they're not an admin. Jane Doe literally intercepts the packet and edits ad, uh, admin to false. What the signature tells us is that, hey, when I generated this on the server, actually the, the, the admin was false. I don't know why you've received it as true, but I, it was false. And I know that because when I hashed this entire JWT, it got a different hash than what I'm getting now when I try and decode it. So now I know this JWT um, is not valid. It's been tampered with. So JWTs are a way of sending tamper-proof data, not secret data, but tamper-proof data from um, two systems. All right, that's a bit theoretical. Um, let's write some code. So here's a really, um, we have the JWT library in Python and here's a really simple um, use of the JWT library. So we always have a secret. The secret is what's used to like augment the encoding of the JWT so that I know um, that it was secure or not. So you basically only store this somewhere on your back end and you hide it from everyone. Then we use the JWT library. So we say jwt.encode, or it's like saying generate me a new JWT. And this is just, this is the data. So in this case, I've got username um, and the value that I'm trying to, to store. I could also add, you know, for example, admin true. All right, but whatever data it is um, that I'm trying to store. And then you give it the secret. So in this case, the secret is comp1531. And then you say, well, what, what hashing algorithm do I want to use to encode this J JSON web token? So they're the different components that you have to pass in to JWT.encode. And when we do that, we get a JWT. So let's see what this looks like. Let's bring this down. Let's run uh, JWTs. Let me just save that. And here we have our JWT. Um, you can see the full stops, the periods, because this is the header. This is a, this is the hash basically of the header. This is a hash of the content, and this is a hash um, of the signature. And that get this is what gets transmitted from server A to server B. So if you're just looking at this, you don't know what it stores. Um, you know the different components of it, but you don't know what the data inside it is. But then if you know the secret 
And if you know the hashing algorithm that was used, you can decode this JWT and print it and you get the payload. The username was Jake. So do you see how this is a secure way we can transmit data um, from, from two servers or from two systems um, without letting anyone in the middle seeing what that value, that data was. And again, the technology behind this, it's basically all just hashing. Now, we need uh, a secret in this case because um, the thing that we're hashing might not be unique. It's not a password. Basically, the password is the secret. In this case, the secret is some string is the secret. That's another way of thinking about it. Okay, so let's take what we've learned um, and apply JSON Web Tokens to our, um, you know, simple authentication and authorization server. So here we have sort of the final um, version of it. We have not, not too much has changed. So we've got this data array, that's fine. Um, we've got a secret here, awesome. Uh, we've got register and we've got login, that's all the same. Now, what's changed here? Um, register is storing the username and storing the hash, that's not changed. It's also storing a session ID. And the session ID is basically, I, I've got this helpers library here to generate it. Let's bring it up. Um, generate new session ID basically just takes, it just generates an, a, an integer starting at zero, going up all the way for every time someone logs in. Um, so we generate these three things, the username, the password, and the session ID. We store the hash of the password um, and the hash is just coming from helpers and it's just doing the exact same hash that we showed earlier, but I've just put it into a function because it's a bit cleaner. Um, uh, I wanted to show register. Okay, and then my token is going to be a JWT using this information, the username and the session ID. So let's run this. Alrighty, now this is running on port 1533 again. We can come over here. We want to register to 1533. Username is Jake. Password is secret, secret. That's all the same. I hit send and we get back um, this JSON web token. Now, what does this JSON web token contain? It contains, look here, the username, so Jake, and the session ID. In this case, it's probably going to be zero or something. So I know that if I want to make a secondary request, um, I can give it back that JWT and it will, and the system will be able to validate the JWT and say, yeah, you are Jake. Cause I just, this is the correct JWT that you had. And if I decode it, it all works. Okay. So if I log in with the username and password, that basically works exactly the same. Um, as, as a, nothing's changed here, right? So logging in, you still take the username and password in, generates a new session ID, um, appends it to the session list and turns it in, into um, a JWT. But I've basically already got this from registering, so I don't really have to do this again. But now what I really wanna demonstrate is this, um, this secret endpoint. So basically I've just got something that I wanna do and I need to prove that I am who I say I am, but I don't wanna keep logging in, right? I, I can't keep giving everyone my password every time I want to do something. I need some other way of proving that I am who I am. And that's with our JSON Web Token authorization. So you can see here that I don't pass my username and password anymore. I pass in my JWT. So let's copy this JWT here. Um, we're doing a post to secrets. It is secrets with an S, yep. Um, I'm not giving it my username and password. I'm giving it the JWT and the JWT. And this is fine to pass around because this JWT, A, you need the secret to be able to decode it. And when you do decode it, there's no password in it anyway, because to have this JWT, I had to already be authenticated and the session ID had to be registered in the session list. 
So now if I hit secrets with this JWT, you can see, okay, in this case, my secrets endpoint just returns the secret if, um, if it is able to authenticate. But if it's the wrong JWT, just one character is different um, in the JWT. I don't get authenticated. Okay. And that's basically the three authentication, authorization, and JWT concepts um, that you need to use, you know, you need to know and use for the project, um, sort of implemented and demonstrated conceptually. Um, so I know that's a lot of content to get all at once, and there's a few new concepts here for some of you. So I'll give you all a second to answer, ask some questions if you want to. I'm going to go through um, the chat now. There's not too many questions. But um, so I just saw, so Steve says, what's the secret mean here? Um, can we change the secret to any other choices? Yeah, as long as uh, you, you should, you know, the secret can, can be anything um, when you're generating a JWT. Um, uh, as long as it's secret. So Hamish is saying we don't need the secret. You don't need the JWT. JW, decoding JWTs does not require the secret. It, doesn't it? Yes, it does. To decode it, it requires the secret. It's not in. It's not in. It's not in the body. But you need the secret to decode it. To to v validate. To validate the JWT. This isn't passed in as data that's going into the body. This is this is generating the signature so that I can validate that it was generated with an appropriate signature and that some other JWT was not generated, was not used to generate something with a body that I wanted to, to fake it in. Yep. Yeah, you can, I mean, it is a good point, Hamish, that I sort of skirted around. You can, JWTs aren't a way of like securely hiding information and storing it. It's a way to transmit information that can be opened. That's why, the, you know, I'm not putting the password in here, for example. There's nothing, I want people to know that my username is username and the password is, you know, that, sorry, that my username is Jake. But I don't want people to be able to fake a new JWT that can't be, that can be decoded without the secret. So the secret is the key. Yeah, exactly. Um, what if the user has multiple sessions? That's fine. If I log in, if I were to log in again, um, can I undo? That would be nice. Oh, I can. If I log in again, I get an, a new JWT back and a new session will be authenticated. And then I could use this JWT instead. What's it called? Secrets. Um, and you can see it's a different JWT. This one ends in P20. This one ends in AK, uh, KLI or something. Um, I hit send and, I, and I'm logged in again. Um, so, but what's kind of cool, actually, if we go back, I don't know, actually, if I can show it, uh, here we go. Yep. So this is the two JWTs, um, that were generated. If you look at the header of these two JWTs, they're exactly the same. Why? Because I use the same hashing algorithm to generate this JWT. Even if you look at the body, they're exactly the same. Why? Because I, I encoded the same data, um, but the signature is different um, because the hashing algorithms, the JWT is taken to, oh, the, why is it? Because the JWT is taken into account like a timestamp to show that this was generated at a different time with a different session. Um, yeah, the session ID would be different in this case. 
No, it's not. There's no session ID in this one. This was for login. So this is just because when you generate a new JWT, the signature is always different. It basically uses some random um, input to generate a new signature. Because if it was always the same signature, you could always just fake it with one that you know was correct. Um, okay, Muhammad, so we can replace secret with session ID and be logged in on two different devices. No, no, you can, don't do that. If you were to use a session ID as the secret, um, then as long as you knew a valid session ID, you could always generate a fraudulent JWT. The secret should always be a secret key that no one knows about other than your server that's generating the JWTs or validating the JWTs, but you can put more session IDs in the body of the JWT. And then when you decode the JWT, you can check, is this token, is this session ID valid? Um, okay, okay. Could you draw a flow chart um, of, if you ask, yeah, of what? <laughs> I mean, happy to try and Try and draw something. It might be a bit difficult, but I'm happy to try. Um, there's some really good resources on JWTs. Let's have a look here. This is the big one. Have a look at uh, this website, jwt.io. So they uh, provide libraries um, for generating and handling JWTs. It's not something that we do um, ourselves, but um, they've got some information on it. Okay, Fatima says, I'm confused by session IDs. Um, I did sort of go through that a bit quickly. So let's, let's do this again. Um, when a user registers or logs in, we generate a session ID. In this code, I've got a really simple way of doing that. And it's basically, we have this global sessions tracker that starts at zero. And every time someone generates a new ID, we just add one to it. So the first time someone registers or anyone registers, right? It gets, it starts at zero, then it's one, then it's two, then it's three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when we log in, we say we, in the JWT that we give back, um, here, right? So someone registers or logs in either or we say, Hey, thanks Fatima. Your password was all good. I hashed it. I stored it. Here's your session ID. I'm putting it in this JWT. And I give you a JWT. When you come back to do something else, like access secrets, you give me your JWT. And that means I can check the session ID that was in that JWT. And then I can say, hey, is that session ID... Um, let's see here. Is that session ID? Where's my sessions list? Am I looking at the right code? Or am I not doing anything with it? Oh no, sessions list. That's what I was looking for. Where is that? Here it is. Sorry. So it's in the user. Okay. Yeah, my bad. Um, so a user has a username, a password, and a list of valid session IDs. So when someone gives me back their JWT with a session ID in it, I can say, hey, is that session ID valid? Is it in the list of valid sessions for this particular user? And if it is, then I know that they recently authenticated with me and I trust that they are who they say they are. And then what you would do is you could say something like, you know, every, it, it, it's up to your application and how, how, what the type of data you're storing. But I could say every 48 hours, um, remove the session ID. So that in 48 hours, if you tried to give me the exact same JWT back, um, I would take it, decode it. Yep, it's a valid JWT. The session ID was zero and I look and I say, oh, it's actually no longer in the sessions list. 
So you actually need to sign in again and generate a new session ID. Um, I think the best way to get your head around it is to download Auth v3, uh, download the lecture code and, and play around with Auth v3, register, log in, use the JWTs, um, look at how the sessions list is storing the information and get your head around it that way. So hopefully that helped just a little bit, um, Fatima. Um, so Stephen says, is putting the user is putting the user ID in the JWT a bad practice? It could be. It could be. I, I mean, this is a really simple application to keep things simple. You might want to store some some other way, but I don't see a major problem with storing the user ID. You might want a user ID, it's like a, a number, not a name. That might be a bit better. Um, yeah, that's probably what you would do. Use some some identifier, not their real name, but for the sake of this really simple lecture demo, um, we're just using the, the username that they submitted. You could even hash the username um, and use that, for example. Um, so it's Zony, do JWTs expire? Like the user shouldn't be logged in forever, right? So JWTs, that in, the, in, the, in the way that we've implemented them here, themselves they don't expire. Right, but um, it's this concept here that you can use to make sure someone isn't authenticated forever. So what you put their session ID in the list, and you can have a job that goes okay, and then you can store when that session ID is no longer um, valid, so that you could just remove it from the list, or you could clear the list, or when you log out, you delete it from the list, or however it is that you're actually storing it, and that's how we can manage. Um, the life cycle of their, of their session. Um, why not use JWT expiries? That's another potential way of expiring the JWT itself. Um, it, yeah, it's probably just another way of doing it, I guess, using the JWTs themselves. I don't think there's anything that would be missing from doing it that way. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, a handle, Steve. Yeah, you generate a handle. Yeah, expire the session every five minutes. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it feels like sometimes. Okay. Alrighty. Um, yeah, this is a really, um, you know, all of these concepts are a really important, interesting, large field in and of themselves. If you're curious about this stuff, just go nuts, do some reading. Um, you know, check it, check it out yourself, um, play around with it. We can't go into all the different details like Hamish is saying um, with, you know, some of the other technologies and things that you could use with the JWTs, like making them expire themselves. Um, but, you know, there's different ways to do it. Um, this is just what I implemented for the lecture code. So I really just recommend the best thing is to play around with Auth v3 and the helpers file you know, run it through line by line um, and then play around with it. Okay, a couple more questions. Why choose to decode rather than storing tokens to verify users? Why choose to decode? Well, the JWT is our token, right? I don't know if I 100% get the question. And the decode basically allows us to prove that it was an authentically generated JWT. That's why we decode it with the secret. Um, I think Stephen is replying to Hamish saying that if we did that, we wouldn't need a sessions list. Um, okay, the reason that doesn't work is because if, if I didn't store session information in a database or in the data store, then if someone logged out, how would you then... If you, so user logs out, but they still have a JWT that's not expired yet, that, would, that JWT would be authenticated. And now they would have authentication again, even though they logged out. So it would actually cause a security risk in that place, unless there's something I'm missing, but I don't think there is. Um, and the reason... The reason... Um, yeah, I mean, so then you could only store revoke tokens, but then you're still storing stuff. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it, I'm sure you could build a, 
build an alternative approach that works. And maybe that is a way that's commonly done. But at the end of the day, you need to store something because you need to potentially kick people out or let people in and things like that. Um, but you always need to store something. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. Why don't you store the entire JWT? Because you don't need to. It's got a lot of information on it that's just to prove um, the, the authenticity of the content. So why store data that we don't need to store, like the, the signature or the header, for example? Um, so that, yeah, that's, I mean, that answers also Stephen's question. Why store the entire JWT when you could just store the session ID and the username and password? You'd have to now store a, a, a much bigger piece of data, which might not seem consequential, but in really large scale applications, every, every little thing matters. There might be some other complications with storing JWTs, but I don't think there are, but there could be, I'm not too sure. All right, it's 3.05. Let's take a seven minute break. <laughs> Again, sounds good to me. Um, yeah, I really recommend that you um, download this lecture code after the lectures and play around with it. Do your own research. And the, and the thing with, with these, you know, security things, you just want to make sure that you're always staying up to date with the best practices that's used in industry. So SHA-256, for example, probably isn't um, an industry standard. Maybe using some of the JWT technologies like the expiry and things like that would be a little bit better as well. All what you've got to learn, what I'm trying to say here is that this field changes quickly. How things were done 10 years ago is no longer secure necessarily. Um, so you've got to stay up to date. You've got to learn how to do your own research and use best practices. And the other thing with this stuff is you don't want to do it yourself. Use the libraries like the JWT library um, or the hashing libraries. Um, or basically, you could, there are basically big entire authentication systems that you can use um, because they get audited. They put a lot of effort into proving the val validity of those systems. And we want to rely on that as much as possible. This is one of the areas where unless it's academic pursuit, you don't really want to be building a lot of these individual sort, you know, hashing algorithms and things yourself. Um, so keep that in mind. All right. I'll see you all in five to five to 10 minutes. Um, have a stretch, get a coffee. I'm going to make a coffee too. Um, get some water. Um, <laughs> yep. Write your own encryption and decryption algorithms. And, and hopefully, I mean, you're all really smart people. So um, maybe you'll do it. You'll do a really good job. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, stay on top of it. Do your own research and don't trust people like me. Um, I'm no, no one is, you know, no single person is a, is really an expert on this stuff. Always, when, especially with this stuff, I mean, you should always be skeptical, but especially with this stuff, be skeptical. That's why I like what, you know, Hamish is challenging, like, why are you doing this? Why are you not doing this? That is the right way to think about it. Um, and you should all try doing that, especially with security, because, you know, maybe something I've shown you is wrong um, or not the, the state of the art or not secure. And this isn't licensed to go off and just do this. You need to, if you're building a system like this, not so much for the project, you know, don't worry about the project. I mean, when you go and get a job um, and you're working in industry, you know, and even if, even if, let me go to, um, even if you're working on a project with a team and they're doing something and you're thinking, oh, I don't, that doesn't seem right to me. Have the confidence um, to challenge that um, and be skeptical and ask questions and push because, you know, you might feel a bit embarrassed maybe, but if it goes wrong, you'll end up like Adobe or <laughs> Evite with millions and millions of passwords breached um, and liability concerns. And, you know, you can really impact people's lives if they get their identity stolen, their credit card information stolen. So be skeptical. I really like that approach. Go have a break, have a stretch. Um, and I'll talk to you in five minutes.
Okay, and we're back. Oh, look at that. My taskbar's gone for some reason. Um, alrighty. Oh, cool. Richard Stallman made new. That's cool. Genie. Yeah. So yeah, if you can't see the code, then you don't know what it does. I guess that's the <laughs> basically the short of the concept, Felix. Anyway, welcome back, everyone, um, to the second part of today's lecture um, on. Let's quit. Let me quit that. Let me move that up here. Five point three development concept called persistence. Um, now. With the project that you've built um, and that you're building, um, you know, this is a, a course with a limited amount of time and a lot of different things we want to cover. And so that means we need to make decisions on what we include and what we don't include. Um, and one of the things we're not including is basically persistence. Um, or, no, that's not true. You still persist, but... We're not doing everything, you know, in sort of the cutting edge way that you would in, in industry. Like, for example, we're not using a database, right? Um, just because we would have to cover a lot of concepts and things um, to get that working. But um, we still need to talk about and show, and your uh, server, um, the project does still use persistence, but it doesn't use it in the form of a, a database necessarily. Um, we're going to just talk about a bit more basic ways that we can persist data and actually what the concept of persistence means um, in, in software development. I, I'm not too sure how much 1511 goes into it. Maybe you guys can let me know if you do any persistence at all. Um, but I mean, you can probably gather from the name, you know, what persistence, <laughs> what persistence means. Um, but basically persistence is, is the way that we treat and store data. Um, and data is really, you know, in, in many ways, just as important or more, it's more important than the software that you write. Everything that you build either generates, uh, manipulates, or stores data. Um, data is the lifeblood of many companies. Think of Google. Their algorithm is meaningless if there isn't something to, 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 to index or to store or to look at. Um, that's sort of a bad example, actually, because the information is stored on the websites. But, you know, I don't need to tell you how important data is. Um, so we're going to cover data generally, persistence, and then specifically we'll look at some Python tools. Um, you know, you get the idea now. This is how we do a lot of lectures in 1531. So what is data? Let's take a step back again. So data is basically some facts um, that can be recorded and have some implicit meaning. Um, so raw data um, can be used and interpreted to find some insights from the information that allows us to make decisions, perhaps. Um, data and big data generally are becoming really important topics in industry. You know, in the last five, ten years, data science has become a, a mammoth industry on its own. And, and these are experts that are being trained and creating a lot of business value from knowing how to um, represent information as data, how to store it properly, how to um, write algorithms that can find insights from this data. That's what all data science is about. It's you've got, a, you've got some data, how can I learn as much as I can, get as much value from it? Um, we're not covering data science in this course. Even, you know, Python is a large data science um, language. Um, but we're going to be talking from more of a systems engineering perspective, um, some ways that we can handle, manipulate and store data. Um, so data is a part of every application, whether or not um, you're persisting it. So if you have a, a variable in memory or an object in memory, you know, you've got data. You've got some information that you're storing digitally in your program. Um, however, when people say, you know, data... They're probably talking about um, something that's persisted and stored. Most commonly, it's a database, but it could just be a data file, a binary file, a text file, a JSON file. Um, usually, that's what people mean when they say data in software engineering. Um, if, if you're talking about in-memory data, you would probably just call it memory or just variables or something like that. Um, so if you have a look here, here's you know, four uh, layers in a software application and, and what data is. Um, 
means at those layers. So if you're, for example, interface layer, this is where you're building your HTTP requests and um, sending those requests. Well, the data is what you package up and send over the requests. It's the JSON body or the query parameter. In the app itself, um, you might have some business logic at the business layer. Um, and that's, you know, data that's input into your application, for example, in a user interface or something like that. Services, so how do you uh, manipulate that data on a back end or something like that? And then finally, is right at the bottom, you need some way to store that data such that when you turn your, you know, shut your program down or you restart your server or you move servers, you don't want to lose all the information, um, you know, all the messages that have been sent on your Teams chat or, or anything. Um, <laughs> persistence is a really important concept. Um, so databases is probably by far the most common way that we can um, store data, right? Um, this isn't a databases course. Um, I think Jazz teaches the databases course, so you can um, go off and take that course if you're interested um, or you need to. But basically, um, we have a system, an application, uh, whose entire job it, it is to write, commit, and store data to some sort of file format that is a bit of a black box, so you don't need to really worry um, about how it's being represented. Um, and then it gives you tools um, to query that data in efficient manners. So let's have a look at the slide here. There are three main ways to store data. In memory, so we talked about that. That's just your variable. Your data store, for example, is an in memory, um, it's called a data store. It's storing data in memory. You can have a file, um, uh, data store. So where you, you just take some data and save it to a file, a text, it could be a text file. It could be a binary file. Um, anytime you've written like a JSON file or something or a YAML file or something like that, you've created data and stored it in a file. And then we have in database where we have some format that we don't really, we don't write these files ourselves or, um, we use database applications, um, to generate the database for us. It's a very schematic way of storing data across tables and things like that. Um, and there's a few different technologies for database storage, but um, a, a good way of thinking about it is as you go deeper, so, you know, databases are much more complex, but they're really efficient. Um, files are really easy to write and easy to read, um, but they're not as efficient as databases, for example. And then in memory is not even persistent. So it's super easy. You just create a variable, um, but you lose it when you, when you stop your program. Um, yeah, study comp 3311 if you're more, if you need to learning about SQL and databases. So what is persistence? It's worth saying when you run a Python application, you might have a, a data store. You put data in the data store. You append things to a list. When you quit that application, you turn the computer off or you restart the computer, all of that data is lost because the memory is wiped. It's in RAM, read, you know, um, random access memory. Um, it's not a persistent memory store. Um, and that makes sense. But we need to persist data sometimes. And you will need to persist data in the project. So if a user types a message or posts a message to the endpoint, you need to store that message so that when the server runs the next time, it can retrieve the message and bring it back. And the way we do that is writing it to the disk of the computer. Um, so can we modify our project server to persistently store data? How would we do that? Let's do um, some demos with a library called pickle um, and a concept called pickling, which is it's kind of a weird word, but, but basically it's a really simple concept. You take a Python dictionary, right? You, that you know and love. And basically it's a library that lets you just pass in the dictionary and it will just write it to a file that you can then read from later and turn it back into a dictionary. Um, so let's jump into some code here. I think this, so this is pickle file here. All right. So we just import pickle. Um, again, it's a really funny name. Um, and we have some object here. All right. So this is just a Python object that's storing an array. Can you all read it nicely? It's storing an array with some politicians. Um, 
all right, and it's called data structure, then we say, actually, and we'll talk about this syntax here, but basically let's open a file called export.p um, in this mode. I'll talk about that in a moment. And using the pickle library, we're calling a method called dump. And we pass in this data structure dictionary that we created with our data and the file, which is this export.p. Let's run this. Um, yeah, I think that's all I need to do. You can see this file just got generated here. So the program ran, it opened a file called export.p by default in the same location as the, as the, the file that I'm executing. Um, and it dumped some data into it. If I click this data, I can't view it. Now, why is that? Why can't I view it if it's just in the file? Well, there's, what have I done there? There's multiple different ways to, um, set up the formatting of a data file. There's basically two ways that I know, binary and text. So you've probably seen this before, but this is saying that open a file called export.p in write mode, that's what the W means. I want to write to the file and binary mode. So I want this to be a binary format. I don't know if you've seen this with syntax before. Have you guys seen this? Have we covered it in the course yet? Maybe early weeks. I can't quite remember now. But have you, does anyone, do we want to talk about this, this syntax? Or are we all sort of okay with it? The with and as. Damn, I'm out of order. Okay, I don't think we've seen it. Um, all right. Can I get some signs of life <laughs> from others, please, as well? Let me know if you're following along. Okay, the syntax is not too complicated. Basically, it says, so this is the, the, the real sort of line here. We can just have this, you know, on its own somewhere. Um, but we only want a reference um, to the file if we were able to open it and for a small amount of time. So the with as syntax basically says, try and run this line of code, getting a reference um, to the file and storing it in this variable here. So open export.p as a file and put it in this variable here and it will only exist in this block. So I can't access file here, for example, um, because it's only, it's only available in this, in this block. Um, yeah, we did talk about it in the PyTest lecture, Stephen. Yeah, you're right. So anyway, there's nothing really too fancy going on here. File will represent um, the contents of export.p only inside the width block. That's, that's basically all you need to, to, to understand about it. Um, but that's it. We've, we've pickled this dictionary into a file called uh, export.p. If we come over to unpickle, um, we can open a file and see this is not using the with syntax. So this is what we mean by alternative way. Um, so this is just opening the file directly, quickly passing it to pickle.load, which can load a binary file and stores the unpickled data in a variable called, um, called data. Um, and if I run this, uh, Python three unpickle, there we go. There, there is the data that we pickled earlier, but this is a completely different application. So it's not reading it from memory. It's reading it from the file and Muhammad, you're hundred percent right. Um, when this block ends, it closes the file. So th th yeah, I should have said this to be honest. This is the reason we have the with blocks for files. When we're reading a file, um, or especially writing to a file, we need to lock the file so that other applications or the, the user doesn't edit the file while we're mid reading it. Um, and so if we don't do this, we need to remember to close the file explicitly. If we open it sort of the way I think about it is, is like opening it temporarily while we're in this block. Um, 
And here we're just opening it, opening the file ourselves like this. So you might need to close the file here. Um, you know, I don't know if that's the, the syntax for it. Um, and we load the data and print it out here. And there we go. That's a different application. It's not in memory. It's actually stored um, in the file. Um, any questions on pickling and unpickling? It's a pretty simple concept. Have a dictionary, learn, uh, have a library that can take the dictionary and write it to a file and then read it back later. Um, let's see. So there's some binary code in export.p, 100%. There's, there are zeros and ones in export.p. That's why it's not really letting us view it. We can open it anyway. I mean, there you go. There's some format. It's actually done a somewhat decent job. So that tells me that Pickle actually is storing it in um, some... It's not doing anything crazy, you know. Um, but you can see it's not quite, <laughs> it's not quite right. It's VS Code, it's doing its best to represent it, but it is a binary file. Um, I'm just trying to see, I think, um, I think if we go just write a file, let me delete export.p and we run Python 3 or Python pickle. Oh, there we go. So pickle only writes in bytes. So the file has to be opened in byte mode. There you go. I was just wondering if there was a way to, to dump it as text. I'm not a, I'm not an expert with the pickle library. I've never actually used it before. I'm just Googling off screen pickle dump as text. I think it has to be a, a, a binary mode. I think. Anyway, that's we're getting off to, off topic. It doesn't really matter. It just means that it, this isn't going to be stored in a file format that users are going to be easily able to read. But anyway, we have pickle and unpickle. Nothing too um, complicated happening here. Um, Oops, don't use that via, that's the wrong code. We've got another demo I wanted to do. Okay, demonstration. Oh yeah, I could, yeah. So, um, Dinyanda asks a great question. <laughs> why, why are we talking about pickle? Um, and that's exactly what, what I'm gonna talk about here. But you are going to use pickle, you can use pickle as a way of, you know, I said when you're building iteration two and three, um, uh, when you're building this project. We don't want to lose all the messages that our users send in your app. We need a way to store that data. And you've got a data store, which is just a Python dictionary. So, I mean, can you connect the two links here? You can use pickle to represent that data in a file so that when your server restarts, you can read the content and keep going. So you're persisting all your messages, your channels, your users to a file in your, in your application that's accessible via HTTP. And that's exactly what this app here is going to demonstrate. So how can we sort of use Pickle in, an, in a HTTP application um, in a server to persist data? So let's run through it again. We have this data, um, data is a list, all right? It's a Flask application, we've all seen this before, and we've got the Pickle library. Nothing new here so far. All right, when the application runs, um, we try and open a file called datastore.p reading in a read mode in a binary format. If that doesn't work, we, we just pass, we just continue. We just, uh, yeah, quit, quit out. So we don't have a file here, but we'll always be able to load, load data sort of P. All right, we've got some methods here, get the global data, that's no problem. We've got this save method that um, gets the data 
um, object and uses pickle to dump it to the file in write mode. Okay, no problem. And then we have a, a, a Flask route um, that can take some data from the HTTP POST request and save it um, to the data store, right? So add it to the dictionary and then call this save method, which actually pickles it and saves it in the file. So as the server is running and, and the, the add method, the add endpoint is hit, um, our data store is going to grow. Um, and we just run this. All right, so let's let's get this going. Python persistence. Um, that's fine. Running on port 5000. Okay, let's go to Postman. Um, let's, whoops, I don't want to save that. Um, what did I say? Port 5000, here we go. We're going to do, I think, a post. Yep, a post request to add. Now this server's running, so it's already tried to load data store.p um, and put that data into data. So data already should have some data depending on what's in this data store, in the data store.p file. Um, so let's hit add and then basically, uh, so the key's just gotta be data. So we have a body here, um, we have raw, we have a key and we have an object. Does someone want to give me some data that we're going to store? Something safe for work, <laughs> please? So we're going to send some data over HTTP um, to our server here. I need like the waiting music from like those trivia shows or something. <laughs> Come on, guys. Comp, I like that. I like that. Comp is a bit of a pickle. That's good. All right. Um, is that right? What's wrong with this? No, maybe that is right. All right. So I hit send. 404 not found. What did I do wrong? Slash add. Oh, yeah. It helps if I put the endpoint in there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can't, cannot water too. Damn. We'll do that later. All right. Um, so make sure you put the endpoint in. Hot tip. Hit send. We got a server error. What's the server error? What have I done? Um, okay. There was the 404. That was the one from before. Um, it's hard to read this when it's zoomed in. It's so small. Yeah. None type is not subscriptable. Persistence line 30. Data dot append. You know what? Let me delete this file because I don't remember what was in it. Let me start the server again. All right. Still an error. All right. I've run this just before. What have I done? Exception on post on add. That's fine. Um, persistence of pyline 13 add. So I don't think it's getting, I don't think it's getting the data. Is that what's happening? Let's see. Oh, I really got to put, I got to always remember to do this. Let's rerun it in debug mode. All right, let's send that. None. Okay, so that's what's happening. So data is not being sent. Why is data not being sent? I'm posting to add raw data. Can anyone spot if I'm doing something silly? This doesn't look right to me, but now I can't see why. <laughs> Cause usually it does like formatting. Yeah. Oh, is that why? 
Is that why it wasn't set to JSON? Yeah, yeah, why did it do that? Why did it change that? All right, there we go. Um, yeah, thanks to you guys. Yeah, we got it at the same time. Awesome. All right, I sent a key data, a value, comp is a bit of a pickle. Um, now we'll probably see somewhere that it printed out. There we go. Data, comp is a bit of a pickle. It gets that data argument out. So it gets the value, comp is a bit of a pickle appends it to the data store. So in data now, um, it's got the value data, uh, comp is a bit of a pickle and it saves it. So it gets the data store, the current value in the data store and dumps it into the data store file. Um, and I can call it again. And um, what was the other funny line? I thought coconut water. How good is coconut water? Let's send that. Okay, look at this. Now, I sent coconut water and it returns the, the current data store, which is also containing the, the comp is a bit of a pickle value and the coconut water. But this has persisted. So what's, what's new here is that I can quit this server. There you go, the server is down. If I bring the server back up, now typically in any of the applications we've been writing in Flask up until this point, we would have an empty data store now, right? Do we all agree with that? I would be starting from scratch, but I've got this data store.p file and it's loaded it. So the data store object now has some data in it. So if I put a third value in, you know, let's call it use JSON not text it's our original data's back how cool is that and it's, it's not very many lines of code either um, using a really simple library and if I delete let's say I bring the server down let's say I delete data store.p I bring the server back up I probably could have just run it with the server down I'm not sure and I, I add this again you can see they're all gone now because the data was stored in that data store.p binary file. Pretty simple, but really, I mean, pretty powerful. It's not the safest way to store data um, because the binary file could be easily corruptible. If one bit goes wrong, maybe a lot of different data is broken. You won't be able to read the data anymore. But as a really basic introductory way to persist data, it's a pretty good approach. Um, and it's a pretty efficient file format too, because you're storing binary, you know, you're not having to store ASCII values of text. So um, it's not too bad, but that, that's pretty much it for persistence. Did we have any questions on any of the stuff in 5.3? Um, Alex has asked, is there a way to automatically call save every time we bring down the server? Ooh, good question. So the, the question is if, we, if, we, if we're stopping the execution of the server, um, um, can we like quickly save, um, can we call the method? Now let's have a look here. There is a way to do this in Python. So there's this library at, at exit. So let's do something at exit. Um, and then you basically have a method called, um, you, you write a method yourself. Okay, this is just gonna print, my application is ending, but in here you could just use pickle.save for example. And then you just need to run, um, oops, at exit register exit handler. So the function that will execute when it, it quits. Now this isn't going to work perfectly. You can imagine if the computer like loses power, it's not going to know to run this, but let's say I do, there we go. I quit the application. It says application is ending. And if you're quick enough, you might be able to save data to a file, <laughs> but that's not really how you need to worry about doing this. Generally, you'll just save the data um, on the HTTP uh, request, for example. Um, encryption of the data store. That's a cool idea. You could explore that, just wrap it around. Um, a, an encryption library, right? We're not, you don't have to do this in this course, um, but it's not a bad, it's not a bad thing to think about. 
Alrighty, let me just get the feedback form link. Share. Alrighty, there you go. You can scan that or um, here is a link to the feedback form for today's lectures. As always, I read every single one um, and I try and, you know, <laughs> adjust as we go. Um, and some of you write some nice messages every now and then, and that, that's nice as well. But um, if you've got feedback, um, feel free to, to post it. Now, I know um, that especially the JWT stuff was a lot of information condensed very quickly. Um, you will understand it like always. You might just need to watch the lecture one more time. But really, I think the best way to understand that stuff is to run the JWT code yourself, read a few articles online and just start and spend some time getting your head around it. Um, and you'll be absolutely, absolutely golden. Um, so yeah, any final questions? So Muhammad, could we make two data sources and check if they're the same to try and invent corrupted data? Um, interesting approach. Let's see. Not efficient is the first thing. It's an exact one-to-one -one duplication of the data. I like that. I like that you're thinking about it though. That's, that's good. We spoke earlier in the lecture about hashing. You can hash a string and you get a value that represents that string. And if you hash the string again, you get the same hash and you can check that the string was the same, right? Well, you can actually hash not just a string, an entire data store. You could hash data store.p. And when you hash data store.p a second time, you can check that the hash is the same. And then all you need to store is a small hash string and you can compare the, the, the integrity of the file. In fact, this is what Git does. Git is basically a hash monster. It uses hashing everywhere to validate files, basically. Um, and that would be a really interesting thing that you could go off and build and basically use hashing to um, calculate a string that represents the integrity of a file. In fact, what Git does is they hash, it hashes entire directories, folders of files and other folders and other files, and it hashes them to, to validate the integrity of a directory so that it knows if it downloads a directory from a server, is every single bit in place. And if a single bit in a single file in a single directory is not exactly the same, you're gonna end up with a completely different hash and Git will know that I wasn't able to actually successfully download this directory, for example. So I like the way you're thinking. There are much more efficient, um, delicate ways of doing something like integrity checking. Um, and hashing is a really good first step at that. Um, and there's probably some other techniques, but good question though, good question. So yeah, uh, encryption's a different thing. Yep, we well, already spoke a little bit about that. There's heaps of encryption libraries in Python. Um, you could go off and just wrap, you, you encrypt the data, then you dump it. So it's basically it'd be like one more step really. And you'll just have a key that you need to keep track of. Any final questions before we wrap up? I know, ah, well, we're wrapping up for the, the term break. Oh, one more thing I need to add. I said in the announcement last night that we would release iteration one marks Friday night, but I forgot that I extended some of the deadlines because of the floods. So it, it'll be early the week after. So sorry about that. I'll make another announcement about that, but I hope you understand because some of the tutorials are this Thursday and this Friday. So it's not enough time to make sure that all the tutors get a chance to do all the marking um, because we extended it. So cool. Is everyone happy? Chat's really quiet today. It's very sad. Are there just less people maybe? Yeah, 33. Alrighty, well, if there's no more questions, thank you all so, so much for coming. Really enjoy the midterm teaching break. 
Um, <laughs> I didn't open a brick roll. Enjoy the midterm teaching break next week. Um, midterm exams, well, we have no uh, midterm exams for 1531 at least. So you're probably all going off to focus on those. Brendan, thank you so much. I appreciate that a lot. I liked today's lecture too. Um, I'll try and open more Rick rolls. Um, yeah, midterm exams, that sucks. Okay, so you're all really busy with midterms. That's, yeah, I get it, I get it. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate having, oh, there's 66 people. What did I say, 30? What's happened there? The numbers are wrong. Anyway, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, you're all doing so well. I'm really proud. Have a great week. I'll see you all in two weeks, but we're still at the forum and, and all of that stuff. So we'll still be in touch. Um, thank you everyone.